So we are opening our uh, first uh, session with a talk by Professor Yuval Shachar from the Department of Information Systems Engineering here at Ben Gurion University. Uh, Professor Shahar is also the head of the Medical Informatics uh, Lab uh, here in this uh, department. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Bracha, Mark, and Lior for putting together uh, this conference, which uh, was a great pleasure last year and I'm sure will be this year. And thank you for inviting me to give the first talk. Unfortunately, Lee Giles uh, cannot be here, so we swapped places. So I'm not Lee Giles. <laughs> I'm Yuval Shahar. I'm head of the Medical Informatics Research Center at Ben Gurion uh, University. And uh, I would like to tell you a bit uh, today about uh, data mining, but specifically temporal data mining. And uh, my examples will be taken from biomedical domains because that is what uh, our Medical Informatics Research Center is about. So uh, let me point out uh, that I will be uh, talking a lot about intelligent interpretation of time-oriented data. And my example uh, will be mostly clinical data, but uh, the examples are pertinent to every domain. Uh, but it will be, I think, more concrete if I uh, give you specific examples from our uh, domains of expertise. So uh, there are really many different tasks, uh, especially in, in uh, medicine, that require the analysis of uh, time-oriented data uh, of large numbers. And uh, a, a, a typical example is uh, that uh, clinical protocols, for example, in oncology, might specify, modify the standard dose of the drug if during treatment the patient experiences a second episode of moderate anemia that has persisted for at least two weeks. So uh, immediately we have a, a question, uh, what exactly is moderate anemia? It's a, a, a concept that is different uh, whether we are talking about a female or a male uh, or a uh, one month year, uh, uh, year old baby. It's, uh, the definitions are quite different. Uh, what does it mean to persist for two weeks? After all, data are really measured uh, as snapshots. Uh, maybe we had hemoglobin on uh, uh, Monday at 9.05 and then uh, another measurement on Thursday. So obviously, there is a question of uh, what do we mean by an episode of two weeks? So there is an implied interpolation function here. There are a lot of uh, complex uh, computational tasks that uh, clinicians actually do automatically, but we need to duplicate them in the computer in order to extract meaningful information from large numbers of clinical data. Uh, examples of uses uh, are therapy, for example, when we are uh, monitoring a, a patient who is being treated by some guideline, uh, monitoring and uh, diagnosis. For example, we would like to notice that there is a gradual increase in the blood glucose values of a diabetes patient. Uh, assessment of the quality. Here we would like to compare uh, the uh, lar a large number of uh, records, of longitudinal records of patients who were treated and compare them to some uh, standard protocol in order to decide whether they are actually following a temporal pattern that would be a legitimate instance of that protocol. And finally, for research, we would like to discover often hidden uh, associations amongst the data, some of them for classification purposes, some of them for uh, predictive purposes. And again, we would like to uh, do uh, uh, some abstraction of the data before we look at these associations. Now, if we focus on the last uh, issue of uh, discovery of knowledge, uh, analysis of uh, the data of multiple patients really has, uh, uh, l can lead us to multiple insights. Uh, in particular, uh, we would like to do uh, one of three tasks usually, and sometimes all of the three. First, we would like to cluster large numbers of patients by their temporal behaviors. Imagine, for instance, looking at uh, uh, 20,000 diabetes patients and noticing that actually they all follow one of five different uh, behaviors over time. We call that uh, temporal clustering. 
Uh, another typical task is that we would like to classify a patient by their behavior and realize that uh, actually they have some uh, additional diagnosis. And finally, we would sometimes like to uh, uh, abstract the data and mine it in order to extract from the patterns useful features. In other words, some of the temporal patterns can be useful features for prediction of meaningful outcomes. A meaningful outcome, for example, for a diabetes patient is whether she will or will not have renal damage, damage to the kidney, which, for example, might lead to dialysis. Uh, diabetes actually um, is the epidemic of the 21st century, and it's one of uh, many chronic diseases, and chronic diseases uh, compose about 25% uh, of the patients, but about 80% uh, of the uh, expenses in Western medicine. So these are really important problems. So we would like to look not just at raw data, but at interpretations of the data, abstractions. So again, not just uh, hemoglobin of 9.7 gram per deciliter, but we would like to, like to look at a period of moderate anemia, which might be might much more interesting. But that means that we need to have an explicit representation uh, of context-sensitive clinical knowledge, because again, we really need to know what moderate anemia means in different contexts. Now, what it leads us is to the realization that we need some intelligent mediation. Our queries are going to be to large databases and they are going to ask about periods of renal damage and deterioration of renal functions and moderate anemia and they have to be automatically interpreted in a context sensitive manner, sensitive to whether this is a female or a male, uh, whether it's young or old, uh, it's a young or an old patient, and whether they are receiving chemotherapy or not, etc. So uh, we would like to automatically answer uh, such queries over time to support multiple tasks. So we would like to mediate our queries through a mediator without necessarily having uh, any knowledge uh, of the underlying uh, schema of the database uh, and without necessarily even having, having the knowledge to perform the abstraction. So typical uh, monitoring and data analysis methods actually usually do not involve a highly sophisticated domain-specific knowledge that can perform this mediation, do not uh, really use uh, an underlying domain ontology, are not really sensitive to the context of the data, are typically not specialized to reasoning about time-oriented data and especially not about uh, intervals, uh, and do not really support all of the monitoring, exploration, and mining tasks uh, that we have in mind. Uh, so the solution is, uh, intelligent monitoring exploration, and for us intelligent really means knowledge-based, a distributed architecture that can uh, recognize meaningful patterns in the data, that can help us in an interactive, goal-directed way to explore the data for meaningful associations, and that also uh, supports uh, an automated mode of analysis in which we discover automatically patterns that we never knew about. Uh, one such architecture that uh, we have created uh, at the Medical Informatics Research Center at Ben-Gurion uh, and have used over dozens of projects is the IDAN temporal mediation architecture which enables us access to multiple databases and uh, allows us to ask uh, high-level queries and uh, get back high-level answers to our queries. Uh, it works something like this. Uh, we have here a user, for example a physician, who is working with the decision support system or with the temporal data mining system. And the query is um, applied through a temporal abstraction controller. For example, bone marrow toxicity grade three in, in 2000 patients. Uh, of course, the controller has no idea what we mean by that. Uh, it asks the medical knowledge service and it says, yes, I know about bone marrow toxicities and they are composed of uh, platelets and white blood cells. So this is what the controller actually uh, asks the data access service to provide, and then uh, sends along the data plus the knowledge to a temporal abstraction service, which actually finds these patterns and returns back these answers to the decision support system. 
That's what we mean by intelligent mediation because the end user and even the decision support system or mining system really have no idea about the data or the knowledge. Okay, so uh, one example just to mention briefly that it, we currently are, in which this architecture is currently being used, is uh, an all European project called MobiGuide in which um, uh, Ben Gurion uh, is uh, the senior uh, academic partner and the coordinator is uh, Professor Mor Peleg of uh, Haifa University, in which uh, 13 partners of five countries are participating and we monitor uh, chronic patients throughout Europe. And we do that through sensors on the patient's body and mobile phones, which broadcast the sensor data back to our servers where it's being analyzed and recommendations are sent back to the patients through their mobile phone and to the providers through the web, and the data are also used for analysis. So that's called the Mod MobiGuide project, and all of the analysis is done by intelligent temporal mediation. Okay, so before I show you some examples of interactive temporal data mining of temporal obstructions, let me say a few words about how do we get from the raw data meaningful patterns that we can then associate. We use for this the knowledge-based temporal abstraction uh, method, which actually decomposes this complex task of abstracting time-oriented, time-stamped clinical raw data into meaningful patterns using five different mechanisms operating uh, in parallel and uh, including a specific ontology of uh, several uh, uh, knowledge types, a declarative type, functional type, logical knowledge, and probabilistic knowledge. I will not say much about this, but I would like to point out that uh, our temporal abstraction service operates by applying the temporal abstraction uh, knowledge-based method. And it, it actually has an ontology of different uh, types of e entities, such as uh, external events, measurable parameters and derived concepts, temporal patterns, uh, goals, and most importantly, context. Uh, and uh, the context can be created by the data itself. For example, if you administer insulin, then we now know that the patient is receiving insulin and we interpret blood glucose values differently. So all of that is performed automatically. And the output is abstractions of states such as high or low blood glucose, gradients such as increasing or decreasing trends, uh, rates such as slow or fast, and patterns such as one-time patterns, periodic patterns, and even temporal fuzzy patterns that have some uh, degree of confidence. So this is the output, interval-based abstractions of the uh, classification of the data, the trends, and higher-level patterns. Okay, uh, <coughs> so um, just to wrap up the question of where do all of these interesting abstract concepts uh, come from, since we start with uh, a lot of raw data, such as uh, hemoglobin 9.7 on January 29 at uh, 9.05. Well, we actually do this uh, through four types of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, structural knowledge is really uh, a map of all of the concepts and the relations between them, such as uh, that anemia is abstracted from hemoglobin. Classification knowledge actually says what is the function that abstracts uh, anemia in women, uh, versus uh, men, versus uh, neonates, uh, one-month babies, etc., uh, into uh, values of uh, um, anemia. So uh, what is moderate anemia, what is severe anemia? It's a context-sensitive function. Uh, that's mostly functional knowledge. Temporal semantic knowledge is different. Uh, for example, if you have two weeks of anemia followed by two more weeks of anemia, then you have a one-month anemia. But if you have nine months pregnancy followed by another nine months pregnancy of the same female, then you do not have a pregnancy of 18 months. So that is because anemia is concatenable and pregnancies are not. This kind of semantic knowledge is part of the logical knowledge that our knowledge base uh, incorporates. And finally, if you had anemia on Monday and anemia on Thursday, then probably you had four days of anemia even though we measured now uh, hemoglobin values on Tuesday or Wednesday, but if it happens on Monday of 1991 and 
Thursday of 1997, <laughs> we will probably just say that you had two episodes of anemia. So that's actually probabilistic knowledge about the half-life of this concept. We actually represent explicitly all this knowledge in order to mine uh, large amounts of uh, time-oriented data because we are first abstracting the data into meaningful concepts using this knowledge and then we mine the result. So uh, let me show you uh, how we are going to, uh, to view the results. And uh, what we are actually going to go through now is a, like a small example of visual analytics. And uh, we are very fortunate here to, pr to have a, a Professor uh, Kane who actually, uh, who actually uh, I think, uh, has created many, uh, many of the original definitions of what visual analytics uh, uh, is. Uh, so thank you for being here. And uh, what we are going to see here is that uh, we start with the raw data. We can abstract them into higher level concepts, such from hemoglobin into moderate anemia or severe anemia. And we can interpolate them in order to uh, create uh, certain intervals. But we only interpolate uh, when our persistence functions allow it. So that would be the semantics of what we actually see. So if we look at a particular example of one of our uh, tools, <coughs> so we see some raw data of measurable overall time, such as uh, white blood cells, but then we see intervals that are abstracted and interpolated uh, for this particular patient. We see some raw platelet counts, and then we see abstractions, and then finally an overall pattern of bone marrow toxicity grade 3. If we zoom by clicking on July, we will see July 1 to July 31. If we zoom on into July 17, you will see 24 hours, etc. We can go down to the level of seconds, and we can go up to the level of 10 years. And then <coughs> we are actually going to see all the levels of abstractions, and uh, that's a very useful way of browsing the data. So <coughs> you can browse it by clicking on a knowledge concept, which opens a panel. You will see intermediate interpretations, and you will see the overall pattern. Okay? So th this is one of our tools. And it was actually evaluated uh, for four years at the Palo Alto Veterans Administration Hospital in California. And let me just point out the bottom line, which was that uh, the users who were actually using this tool were about three orders of magnitude faster than those using just an electronic medical record. And furthermore, their uh, accuracy was significantly higher because trying to assess the, the condition of uh, complex patients, oncology patients after bone marrow transplantation, led to only 57% accuracy for the physicians who were using just the electronic medical record, but to 90% accuracy of uh, physicians who were using this particular tool, which we, by the way, call NAVE2. Uh, all of this was funded by the uh, NIH, the National Institutes of Health. Okay. So we know that this actually is working and is useful for single patients. Now we extend it into looking at thousands of patients using the visitors system, which actually does it for multiple records. And in the case of the visitor system, we would like to now ask not about one patient, but about 100,000 patients. First of all, we would like to select patients such as uh, uh, females above the age of 35, but we can also select females above the age of 35 who had gradual deterioration of their kidney functions, which of course again requires the same knowledge that we have shown earlier in my talk in order to abstract the data. Uh, we, we would sometimes like to select time intervals such as show me a period uh, after the bone marrow transplantation during which at least 20% of the patients had had very uh, low levels of function of the liver. So we would like to abstract all the data and, and, re and return an interval and say, well, during the third week after the operation, more than 20% of the patients have this pattern. And of course, this is something that is uh, extremely difficult to do without such a knowledge base and without some uh, special procedures. And sometimes we would like to just ask about uh, the data. So selection is actually using knowledge-based constraints. So <coughs> again, if we look at the a typical interface, what we see here is uh, the raw data, and we see uh, an abstraction at uh, higher and higher levels for, and this is for a single patient, 
And these are the higher level patterns of bone marrow toxicity, right? And here when we look at the raw data, we are uh, actually seeing that, it, that we are um, creating a scale for each patient using their own data. So again, we abstract it, and now we notice an interesting pattern, which is a V-shaped pattern. It looks like the, the white blood cell state has dropped down to very low and gone up after the operation, okay? And we suspect that it happens in some patients, but it's difficult because each of them was actually uh, operated on a different date over a, a whole decade, right? So we see this V-shaped pattern in two different patients, and maybe it happens for 10,000 patients, right? So what we do now is we are going to visualize all of the patients, and this time, because we have abstracted each of them, the way to display this is by looking at this distribution of the patterns. So the distribution in March, April, May is summing up to 100% of the patients. Here, uh, most of the patients uh, have had the red value in April. So uh, in fact, we are going to look at the patterns of the distribution of concepts over time in order to look at the whole population. And we are aggregating them over all the patients. So here we see now, looking at 1,000 patient records, uh, that's about 2 million data points. Uh, we are looking at uh, the data, which is completely raw here. But now we are looking at actual uh, patterns during the first month, the second month, the third month. And this is the distribution of the Y blood cells after it was abstracted. And uh, again, raw data and distributions uh, in the of the uh, uh, platelets. Again, we can click on some concept from the ontology and we can then uh, see the distribution. Now, you remember that we had a V-shaped deterioration of the white blood cells after the bone marrow transplantation and then they went up. And we saw this for two patients. And the question is, does this happen for 1,000 patients, for 10,000 patients? Well, after we do this abstraction for all the 1,000 patients, here is what we get. We can see that, in fact, <coughs> we can see that, in fact, if we look at the distribution, we see that about eight days after the uh, procedure, most of the patients have a very low white blood cell count. This is now a statistical uh, display of a thousand patients which shows in, in effect the same V-shaped pattern, but this is using distributions of high-level concepts. Now, one question that we were really uh, asked uh, by the chief medical officer of a large uh, health maintenance organization was, is there any difference between patients who are uh, getting an allogenic transplantation, which means transplanting bone marrow from somebody else, or an autogenic transplantation, which means from themselves? And the answer is absolutely yes. If we look at the two distributions after we perform this abstraction, you can easily see that those who are getting the allogenic transplantation actually are recovering much more slowly until they get to the normal values. And those who are getting their own bone marrow are actually recovering pretty quickly, and in fact, about eight days before the recovery of the allogenic patients, the autogenic patients are already, at least 50% of them already are, uh, at a normal count. So we got our answer using essentially a visual analytic process of computation and uh, exploration. Similarly, we can ask about associations amongst the data, because it would be interesting to ask whether those who have le uh, low hemoglobin also have the low white blood cells, which is not apparent from the previous display. So what we see here is a temporal association chart where we actually are showing uh, links between the distributions. So the, the width of the pipeline shows how many patients pass through it, in other words, the support. And the confidence is the conditional probability of getting from this state to this state. So for example, here we see a broad pipeline uh, through which uh, about 40% of the patients are passing. So that's one way of visualizing uh, a typical progression for bone marrow transplantation patients or for diabetes patients over many years, okay? Now, it's interesting that uh, the, this, what happens in the first two weeks after the transplantation is quite different from what happens after the, uh, in the third and fourth week. So if we looked at the granularity of months, 
it would be actually a little deceptive. We actually need to go down to a granularity of two weeks. And in fact, if uh, our, our tool has the capability of uh, creating any granularity on the fly, so here we create a granularity of 14 days, and you can see that there is a very different picture of the association charts in the first two weeks after the operation and the, the third and fourth week. So this is really the true uh, picture. We can also monitor the level of uh, support uh, throughout and see whether it increases. And it turns out that, in fact, this is uh, the same. Uh, th in this way, we recently found that, for example, uh, you can predict five years ahead of time whether diabetes patients really will have renal damage. And it turns out that uh, in the case of males, depending on uh, a parameter called hemo hemoglobin A1c, uh, you can actually go from a, a risk of 14% to 31%. By use and we can easily see this in an, a temporal association chart. But when we do the same visual anal analytical process for females, we find that there is no difference. So it's interesting that this particular factor was important for males and not for females, and it was easy to see it here. Let me just finish by saying one thing. If you actually are exploring data this way, you are doing it in a goal-directed way. You are asking questions. But what if you did not know what to ask? What if the data actually includes hidden patterns that you never knew to ask for? In that case, a goal-driven uh, process is not enough. You also need to have a data-driven process whereby you generate the interesting uh, patterns automatically. And we actually have such a process where we can discover hidden patterns, such as looking at this data and finding some hidden patterns that actually appear in all patients. Th so what we're looking is for temporal interval relation patterns that we don't know about, and we can create a hierarchy of paths that all of the uh, patients will have to see which are the common patterns. And in fact, let me show you an example that using this, uh, a new algorithm that we call Karma Lego, we can look at uh, 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 20,000 patients of, who had diabetes, and we find that actually they had, they had five different patterns that uh, occur frequently. So this is a temporal clustering uh, that is performed in a completely uh, automated uh, way, uh, and using the same abstraction knowledge that I've shown uh, before. Okay? Yes. And uh, we cannot also ask if these patterns have a similar distribution for females or males. Actually not. Actually you can guess whether it's a female or a male with 86% accuracy uh, just by the pattern and similarly for ages. Okay? So, uh, and finally as I promised you can also use these temporal interval relation patterns as features for prediction and we did this successfully in several uh, different uh, domains. So to summarize, what I was showing you today here is that uh, is three uh, uh, different uh, um, concepts. One is that to look at large numbers of time-oriented data, you first have to abstract them using knowledge into meaningful concepts, interval-based concepts. Second, you can actually use goal-directed queries in order to find very interesting associations over time uh, between these concepts and thereby discover new knowledge. If you know what you want to find, if you know what concepts are interesting, but you have no idea how they are associated. And third, if you are not really sure what you want to ask, but you are sure that there are some patterns, then you can use something like the Karma Lego algorithm, which automatically finds and enumerates all meaningful patterns above some uh, threshold of, say, 5%. And then you often find that you discover completely new patterns that you can use as features for classification and prediction. So what you want is both goal-directed discovery and data-driven discovery. Thank you very much. When you presented uh, the uh, data abstraction, you, you do some kind of uh, tokenizing. You have a data and you... Discretization. Yeah. Yes. And I have a question. What about ambiguities? Do you solve ambiguities? If you have pattern that comes from different diseases or you have <coughs> one disease that, uh, that uh, have many of patterns? Uh -huh. uh, I don't want to go into the details of knowledge-based temporal abstraction. That, that would be a, probably a three-hour lecture. 
because as I said, it uses a lot of logical knowledge and probabilistic knowledge, but uh, the short answer is that it actually accommodates several different contexts. So uh, in fact, you could actually have, for example, two different interpretations for the same data. Each of them would be in a different context, and they would both be valid temporal abstractions, and they would both be stored for the same patient. And they, would, they, are, and they are not conflicting because one, for example, says this would be normal blood pressure for a 35-year-old female, and the other would say this is actually a bit high if this female is pregnant, but I'm not sure. So there would be two different abstractions. Uh, any other questions? No. Okay, uh, thanks again, Yuval, and uh, Thank you.